Hello and welcome to Emirates 24-7. Coming up tonight. Rankings released. Dubai's top 100 small businesses have just been revealed. We speak to the winner. Trending worldwide. Have local companies kept up with social media? We'll discuss. And rewarding revolution. President Obama wants $800 million to give to the Arab world. We'll tell you why. But first, to our top story this evening. Small and medium businesses have often been called the lifeblood of Dubai's economy, accounting for 95% of all enterprises and 40% of the workforce. A government initiative will help these firms reach new heights, with the first ever Dubai SME 100 ranking announced this week. Many of the companies were nominated by banks and free zone companies, thereby representing some of the best small and medium enterprises the Emirates has to offer. Dimensions Healthcare took out the top spot and is now officially the best small business in the Emirates. The government-backed initiative will give investors the opportunity to identify the top companies to invest in and show other businesses how they can improve. So joining us in the studio this evening to explain why the brand new ranking will help these firms flourish is Alexander Williams, the Director of Strategy and Policy Division for Dubai SME, and Dr. Omar Gosher, the CEO and founder of Dimensions Healthcare. Gentlemen, welcome this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Alexander, I wanted to begin with you. Now, the Dubai SME 100 ranking is quite different to other gradings we often see around the world, specifically because it looks at the financial and the non-financial performance of these companies. So how exactly do you choose their ranking and why was Dimensions Healthcare the obvious choice? Okay, um, unlike other rankings which just focuses on dim uh, the financials, we looked at the non-financials which drives firm growth, for example, innovation, human capital and international orientation. And our rankings was a labour of love where we looked at just, uh, not just the financials, but also the uh, non-financial aspects, meaning to say that innovation, human capital, and international orientation, which drives a firm growth. Um, and these are the factors that lead to further growth in the economy. So we chose these companies uh, for the fact that we know that when we looked at uh, innovation, innovation would drive their growth besides the financials. And Dimensions Healthcare was chosen because it had strong credentials in all these categories. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Dr. Uh, Roche, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the support you received from Dubai SME. I mean, you've had some support over the last year. Can you tell me a little bit about that and uh, what this new ranking, obviously, uh, the highest ranking will mean for your company? Sure. Um, actually, to start with, uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege and honor, really, to be on the top of the SME 100 list. Uh, the whole process basically was a really a learning experience and, and a great added value for the company. Uh, they a very professional and a uh, very informative uh, process they have at SME and I would like to just use this opportunity to thank uh, His Highness Sheikh Ahmed Al Saeed and His Excellency uh, Mr. Janahi and his team who did a really great job in this. Um, uh, for the process itself we learned a lot. I mean they, they emphasize a lot on potentials and that's a great thing. It's not just by financials. We have good financials, but still we, we are very much interested uh, to see people uh, and, and uh, basically um, like the SME 100 emphasizing and others. We learned a lot uh, through the process. We, uh, we basically uh, benefited a lot from the visibility that the SME uh, 100 gave us. It affected, uh, impacted the value of the company, the, uh, the morals of the team big time, definitely. And we want to get much more on their support on the financing part, where basically there's a very ambitious program they have probably coming for two years to support the companies. And we definitely want to get uh, the benefit of it. <laughs> so, Alexander, what's the next step for Dubai SME over the next few years? How will you continue to support our small firms here? And would you look at something like a secondary market for these small firms to list on? Okay, most definitely. I think the idea of this ranking is actually to address the supply side. Many of the, the VC companies and the private equity firms have complained that you know, Dubai lacks business ideas and lacks companies to invest in. So what our role as Dubai SME we are doing is to uh, create this pipeline of investable SMEs so that the private equity market and VC market ta can take an interest. And of course, uh, for them to, to be listed, you need a platform. So we are working with various uh, institutions such as Nasdaq Dubai and in future Dubai uh, DIFCs, a, a secondary market uh, platforms to help companies list. But in order for them to be listed, uh, Dubai SME is also working on a rollout program to develop these SMEs. To be investable, you need to have corporate governance. You need to 
find the right board memberships, you need to build your equity story, your investment story. And that's what we're doing in the next one, two years to help companies like uh, Dimensions Healthcare and the uh, likes to reach that stage. Mm -hmm. All right, now, now looking at um, some interesting new developments we've seen uh, coming from the government, um, new laws uh, that are set to be put in place in terms of bankruptcy mm -hmm. and also uh, a push towards a new credit bureau. Um, just I wanted to direct this to both of you, uh, obviously, as uh, you know, SMEs are the cornerstone of Dubai's economy, 95% uh, mm -hmm. uh, of business here. Um, what are your thoughts on these new laws? How is that going to change business? Uh, doctor, let's start with you. Yes, uh, well, uh, I think basically the, um, the, the credit bureau is basically maybe they have, will have a more impact on for SMEs, specifically that uh, th there is this, um, this gap between banks and creditors and the SMEs usually. They don't have the feel of, they're not familiar with the market feel, they're not familiar with the, really the value those companies have and how much basically they, they have of really financial foundations. So uh, a, a bureau like this can really fill in the gap very well and give confidence of, uh, for banks to give more and be more courageous to give loans for those SMSEs and, and realize their dreams. Mm -hmm. And Alexander, what, what are your thoughts, for example, on, on both that and of course the bankruptcy law as well? Well, uh, as you speak, um, many of these laws are at the federal level and we have given extensive inputs and uh, uh, views about the various laws, ownership laws, uh, bankruptcy laws, credit information laws. And these laws are currently being uh, discussed for implementation by the Ministry of Economy and the Central Bank. And we should be hearing from them in the next uh, six months. But having said that, uh, the laws are only as good if it's uh, well enforced and implemented. And you need also the players of these laws to be educated on how to execute it. And the banking sector, just to add, uh, plays a very critical role. And currently, there's a disconnect between financing and the requirements of the banks. So we are trying to reach this, uh, bridge this gap by helping the SMEs uh, be able to apply for loans uh, or, or, or look at how they can improve their financials and the banks to set the right expectations for the uh, SME community. And I think this is working quite well now. Well, definitely uh, some very important developments, of course, in the months ahead. Doctor, once again, congratulations. Well, gentlemen, both, thank you uh, to both of you for joining us in the studio. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now after the break, the way we communicate has changed exponentially over the past decade. We hear from one of Sharjah's top leaders to find out how they're harnessing the power of social media. Plus, a global market's dip as ratings agency Moody's warns of more downgrades for Europe despite the new debt deal. Stay with Dubai One. Welcome back to Emirates 24-7. From the time of waiting for the daily morning newspaper to an age of information overload where we stay up to date with the latest news and information from around the world, the way we communicate has changed in leaps and bounds. Social media sites have made it easier to stay in touch with friends and family and they've also played a major role in big moments in history like the Arab Spring. Only today, it was announced that the brand new YouTube channel for His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai, has been launched. Now, the channel is the first of its kind to be launched by a Prime Minister in the Arab world and will even allow greater interaction between His Highness and his people. Sharjah Media Center also understands the importance of social media websites in our daily lives and is set to host the first government communications forum. Our reporter Elham Al Hamari met with His Excellency Sheikh Sultan bin Ahmed Al Qasmi, the chairman of Sharjah Media Corporation, to ask about the challenges of improving communication. I think the uh, main uh, challenge is the uh, misperception of, uh, of the uh, information given by the government. Uh, the government has to be very clear on, uh, on the issues that it's uh, giving to the public and it has to be given in, a, in the right way. Uh, different uh, different uh, communication uh, methods uh, would help and also a lot of uh, public would uh, receive information through different uh, uh, ways. So uh, you, have to be, you have to adapt to these different ways and you have to uh, be uh, able to uh, uh, control the, uh, the information that you give and, and give it in a, in a straightforward uh, way. With cases such as the gas station situations last year, how can the government manage such events? I think the government, uh, like I said, has to be very, very clear on the uh, issue that they're talking about. Uh, the example you gave is uh, one uh, important example that happened uh, uh, to Sharjah, and uh, Sharjah gave it in a, brought it up in a very, very uh, 
uh, clear way. Uh, it, it was clear to the public. It was clear what the government was doing. It was trying to uh, uh, give the uh, public uh, the exact uh, thing that th the exact steps that it's been taking, and uh, I think that worked out very well. Um, whenever you're clear about the uh, about your message, whenever you're uh, clear about the problem that you're facing, uh, the public accepts it as it is. You can always have. Uh, uh, y you can always have any kind of news, and you can present this uh, news in a uh, positive way or a negative way. But uh, you have to be careful on, on how to present it to people. You have to be really in the middle. You don't uh, focus on the positive too much, and you don't uh, ignore the negatives as well. So if, if you give the uh, if you give these uh, informations uh, the right way, I think people would accept that. How do you manage to monitor, stay ahead, and utilize social media? Um, we in Sharjah Media Center, we monitor media through different ways and we're trying to uh, 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 catch up with the latest technologies as well. Um, uh, for example, for the forum itself, we have uh, a special uh, hashtag for um, uh, Twitter. We, we do communicate uh, through that. We do communicate through different social medias as well. Um, whenever we have uh, a specific uh, um, forum or um, something like that. We, we always have the uh, right ways of communicating. Um, through uh, Sharjah Media Center also we have all our news uh, is broadcasted through uh, different media sectors. The customer at the end, they filter wh whatever they uh, want to, uh, want to uh, listen to. So you have to be on the right track and uh, you have to know where to uh, focus as well. You had mentioned the Sharjah Media Forum. Uh, so tell us, what are the key themes that will be discussed in this conference? The main themes that this uh, conference would focus on is uh, one of them is the management of uh, crisis and emergencies in, in the government sector. And uh, to let people understand, or let at least the government sector understand how to manage these uh, uh, problems that they might face. Uh, the other issue could be, um, or the other issue what we are uh, presenting is the uh, uh, spokesperson, uh, government spokesperson. So we, we are trying to um, give the uh, employees, uh, the government employees, uh, a chance to understand how to be a spokesperson, how to uh, manage the news that comes out of uh, a government department through one person who can bring it out in the correct way. Once again, Your Highness, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was Ilham Al Hamadi speaking to His Excellency Sultan bin Ahmed Al Qasimi, the chairman of the Sharjah Media Corporation. Well, as we just saw there, the UAE's government put a renewed focus on using social media. But it's not just government authorities that are adapting to this new web landscape. Companies are increasingly finding Facebook and Twitter as a vital tool to connect with their customers. Joining us now in the studio to tell us how well UAE companies are using these tools and social media has changed the communications industry is Alexander McNabb, a prominent member of the UAE's tweeting community and the director at Spot On Public Relations. Alexander, welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Now, as just mentioned, of course, you work in PR and public relations. So when you're talking to your clients, how much of an emphasis do you put on social media sites like Twitter or Facebook? That's changed a bit or changed a lot. These days, my particular agency would not work with a client that wasn't having an element of digital strategy to their communication strategy. Um, it's vitally important. It's ever more becoming so. And so you can no longer talk about communications as media relations. It's actually about a, a holistic approach, particularly using digital online. That's everything from website, SEO strategy, through to social media like Twitter and Facebook. All right, and speaking of social media, Twitter, Facebook, um, what kind of mistakes do you see companies here making? I mean, we've been a little bit slower to pick it up than some of the other regions in the world. Um, what needs to change? All the mistakes are well known and documented because other companies elsewhere in the world have already made them all. Um, the, the, the tweeting, just company slogans, um, mindless chatter, corporate speak being taken out, out onto the internet, all these, these errors have been made before. And yes, we are making them all again. Um, but one of the things I think that's, that's great is that companies are learning, companies are picking up, that there are different ways of doing things. And it is slower here. And I think the Arab Spring um, from last year has had a huge effect in getting an older generation of business people to take this sort of stuff much more seriously and to take their businesses more and more online. And what they're finding is that that means resources have to change. You, you can no longer just 
spend money on advertising and get your message out there, that megaphone's been taken out of your hands. You actually have to engage with and talk to your customers. And it's amazing for some businesses how much of a shock it is that you should actually talk to customers. I mean, you, you mentioned an interesting point uh, there about the fact that these mistakes have all been made before in, in other markets, and yet we're still seeing the same mistakes being made here. Why do you think that is? Why have we not learned from, I, from I don't other people's mistakes? I, I don't think it's necessarily down to here. It, it's being done elsewhere in the world as well. I mean, we've just seen a remarkable flub by McDonald's and an awful one by Qantas who really got caught out and, and the internet punished them. And these, these are very sophisticated companies in very sophisticated markets. So I don't think you can say it's because we're unsophisticated. It's just that companies are very much trying out these new media. And it really is, it's, it's the Klondike out there. It's a new frontier that people are pushing at. So some companies are learning lessons the hard way. Other companies are looking at case studies, investing in people. And uh, I think fundamentally it comes down to a, an approach, a, a thought through approach. Is your company willing to engage and be transparent with consumers? Or are you going to try and behave like you did in the old days when you had the power of advertising behind you? Um, and then just, just try and take that to, to Facebook and just shout at people on Facebook. And you sometimes hear ad agencies put a value on Facebook likes. There is no value on a Facebook like. Its value is zero, it's suffer, nothing. It, the only value you have is once that person has liked you, do they engage with you on Facebook and do they find the experience of dealing with you on Facebook interesting and do they come back? That's when there's, there's value to it. But the, the value of a like is nothing. So uh, just talking a little bit more about, about that approach, I mean, what do you think is important to keep in mind when you're looking at creating an online presence for your company? It's a party. You go into the kitchen at a party, you listen respectfully to the conversation, and when you think you've got something to give that conversation, you join in, and then people happily let you join the conversation. If you rush into the kitchen wearing a Hawaiian shirt and screaming about how wonderful you are, people will throw you out. So it's, it, the first thing you have to do is listen. Listen to the conversation, listen to what people are saying, monitor for mentions of your brand, once you pick that up then, engage with people and, and actually have conversations with them. One company that's very good at this, for instance, in the region is Aramex. Um, and if you get onto Twitter and complain about Aramex, somebody will pop up and say, hi, what's the problem? And I'll sort it out for you. And they'll sort it out for you. And one of the things I find admirable, admirable about Aramex is not only will they sort it out, they'll change the company's processes and procedures to make sure it doesn't happen to another consumer. That's quite impressive. And that's the, the sort of new responsibility of a company using these media is not just saying, yeah, yeah, we'll sort it out. We're sorry that happened to you. But actually, then you go and put it right. All right. Now, you mentioned, uh, obviously, the issue of you know, the wide scale flubs we're still seeing in terms of you know, using social media. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the Facebook example, uh, the McDonald's example. Um, how much of a problems that present, I mean, you, you're working in, in public relations and PR in terms of promoting your company, the fact that any individual in that company effectively can have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, can tweet what they like, and sometimes it has very serious repercussions. I mean, how do you deal with that? What are the new challenges that come with this kind of freedom? There are challenges. I mean, you saw the London Olympics, where they have 70,000 people working on the Olympics, and they've all been told they can't use social media. And if you think about it, if you're selling TV rights and so on, and there's a guy down on the track actually tweeting, this person just won this race, it, it's kind of hard to, to work out where those rights go. And then behind the scenes, do you want people saying where athletes and, and VIPs are from a security point of view? They have something like 12,000 soldiers on the Olympics. So, and, and they got castigated for coming out and saying you can't actually use social media, but that's a policy. And companies need to, organizations need to have a policy in place. What, are, what is the company's role to you? What's your role to the company? Uh, obviously, many companies in the Gulf are in loco parentis because they're, they're sponsoring overseas employees. So if you don't have a policy in place, really your company is in danger of being associated with the employee's activities. If you have a clear policy in place, the employee knows where they are and you can communicate effectively. Alexander, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Thank you for having me. So do you use social media in your line of work? Make sure to vote yes or no in our new Facebook poll. Here's how to cast your vote. Edwards 24-7 is now part of the social media revolution. To get your daily dose of the biggest news, log on to Facebook and search for Emirates 24-7 on Dubai One. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at Dubai One TV. Make sure to get involved and join in on the nation's conversation. Let us know what you think. Well, it's time now to take a look at how the markets are reacting to Greece's debt deal. Joining us with his expert advice is Gaurav Kashyap, the head of the DGCSJS, get Alpari, Middle East, DMCC. Gaurav, welcome back to the show. Always, Always lovely to see you. Always a pleasure, Katie. <laughs> so as I just said, we have seen the deal uh, announced from Greece. Um, but while some people feel that's a positive step forward, Moody's, the ratings agency, have come out a lot of uh, downgrades, not good news for the UK either. So what's going on? Absolutely, Katie. Once again, I can't agree with uh, Moody's uh, rating cuts from uh, this past morning. Uh, you know, immediately after those rating cuts were done, uh, 
They downgraded nine, um, nine European nations, most notably Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Uh, and you really got to question the timing of these downgrades. We had the Greek parliament uh, announce and confirm that they were going to write into law as additional deeper austerity measures. Yet again, the rating agencies have been very irresponsible and have uh, you know, proceeded with these actions. The, the resulting situation is that the UK has also been um, downgraded to uh, with a negative outlook. Excuse me, they were not downgraded, but they had a neg negative outlook. And that's, of course, because of their proximity with trade relations to the Eurozone. But actually, I think that that type of price movement will have a very short-term effect. What we'll be focusing on will be tomorrow's um, Eurozone uh, finance ministers meet. Once again, they will be reconvening in Brussels, and hopefully we should see ratification of Greece receiving that second bailout of 130 billion euros. If that happens, then we will see the risk coming back into the markets and the euro crosses will sli move slightly higher. That's what we're waiting for. We'll see if it happens. Now, I wanted to talk about the U.S. as well. Some uh, new news from the economy expected to come out there. But again, not great news, a bit of a contraction, a pullback. Absolutely, Katie. So not only do we have Greece uh, driving markets, but we also, we also have a pretty busy economic calendar coming up. Tomorrow we'll be watching the GDP or the total output from the Eurozone. Unfortunately, that month-on-month -month number is supposed to show a slight contraction between 0.3 to 0.4%. Uh, the year on year number is also expected to drop anywhere from 0.5 to 0.6 percent so not a lot not a lot of good news on the gdp output over there uh, and also we'll be watching for the fomc meeting minutes tomorrow from the u.s and of course finally the all in all important inflation data from the u.s which is unexpected to be changed at 0.3 percent but this will be a very important reading because if we see any higher inflationary pressures coming in the u.s you can expect to see the u.s dollar probably strengthening a little bit on the news but overall we're probably looking at uh a week to close uh, favoring the US dollar. I thought it'd be nice for a change. Well, Gaurav, thank you for joining us this evening. Appreciate you stopping by. Well, after the break, US President Barack Obama has announced his brand new budget. Why, well, he's putting aside close to $800 million for Arab countries. Welcome back to Emirates 24 7. It's time to take a look at some more top news stories of the day. And joining us this evening is Lucy Taylor, a senior news presenter for the Arabian Radio Network. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Now, I wanted to begin by talking about U.S. President uh, Barack Obama's new budget. Certainly some interesting developments in there, but I think what grabbed most of our attention uh, this morning is the amount of money that's going towards Arab countries. Close to $800 million has been set aside for what they have called the Young Democracies of the Arab Spring. Now, mm -hmm. big new investment funds set up for the MENA region as well. But it seems like people back in the U.S. may not necessarily be so happy about this. I think a lot of them have been calling for overseas budget to be uh, overseas spending to be cut down a little bit and trying to address some of the budget shortfalls back home. So what's your take on it? Well, I think it's really interesting. It sends a very clear message from the White House that they feel it's important to be involved in supporting these young uh, blossoming democracies in the Arab Spring countries. Um, and that's uh, in a year when, you know, federal budgets are being slashed. Even the Pentagon has taken a cut. Um, so Obama and his crew are saying it's important that we're involved in this. It's important that we build relationships and uh, alliances with these countries at this stage. But of course, it is election year and there are going to be people who don't necessarily agree with that. It does have to be, of course, approved by Congress before the budget is fully passed. In terms of, of, of the 800 million figure, I think it was something of around 1% of the overall budget. Uh, yeah. So if you look <laughs> at it in, in, that, in that perspective, yes, 800 million is obviously a lot of money. But when it comes to budget, they're not really spending that much overseas. Recently, there has been some friction between the US and Egypt, and they specifically haven't cut their military funding to the country, which is interesting to see and, and quite a positive message, I think. Lucy, thank you for coming in this evening. We appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, before we go, let's take a look at tomorrow's news today, the front page stories you'll be waking up to on Wednesday morning. Well, Gulf News reports that King Hamad has highlighted cohesion and unity as a way forward for Bahrain. Seven Days reports on the undercover cops shot in a drugs operation. The National also had the latest on two undercover police officers injured in a shooting during a drugs arrest in Banias. And Khalid Times reports on Syrian forces renewing their assault on the city of Homs as the UN Human Rights Chief raises fears of a civil war. Now that's all we have time for on this evening's show, but join us again on Wednesday night. We'll speak to the author of Too Many Bosses, Too Few Leaders to look at the highs and lows of good leadership. But for now, from all of the team here at Emirates 24-7, it's goodbye.